algorithm. They already know what you're looking at on the internet, right? Uh, they already know uh, where your phone is moving. Now they know what your heart rate is, your pulse is. Five years later, the coronavirus is gone. This data is still available to them. They start looking for new things. Whenever there is a crisis, uh, rationality uh, exits the room and you have uh, a policy that is being driven by panic in the pursuit of benefits that at the time are theoretical. They said these things uh, would work. They said they were necessary. They said they would be beneficial. We don't want to do them. But the threat is so great that this is the only way that we can really counter them. When we see emergency measures passed, uh, particularly today, uh, they tend to be sticky. Um, the emergency tends to be expanded, uh, then the authorities become comfortable, they start to like it, uh, and the original emergency passes. Coronavirus yeah. is gone, it's no longer a big thing. They find new applications, new uses for this new power they gained, uh, and they went, well, maybe we don't need to give this up. Maybe we can pass a new law uh, that makes this a permanent authority. And we've seen this happen in country after country. It's not a local uh, domestic issue. And what people are, are missing, that I think people who are looking at this from a longer span are, are catching, is uh, the coronavirus is a serious problem, but it is a transient problem. What we have is a transition from government that's looking at us from the outside in mass surveillance. They used to be looking at your phone, right? And they wanted to know what you were clicking on, right? They want to know what you were reading, what you're buying, uh, this kind of associated information. Um, but now when we get into this health context, they want to know, are you ill? They want to know your physical state. They want to know what's happening under your skin. If we permit to uh, say, look, we can track every cell phone of every person everywhere all the time. We can make inferences on the basis of this data set and then we can take executive actions uh, as a result of this information. You can search the web with real and organic search results and do it without anyone tracking your activity or data. We ourselves use Atlas VPN to protect our data online. Atlas VPN is more than just any other VPN. It blocks all malicious links, ads and trackers and notifies you when someone is trying to spy on or steal your data. If you want to grab Atlas VPN, they have a great deal going on right now for just $1.70 a month and six months extra for free. We've provided a link in the description you can use to grab this deal. Try it out with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Not only does it protect your data, it also keeps your searches completely private. Also protect unlimited devices at once, no limits are set, one subscription only for the best price. That's why we use Atlas. Oh, did we forget to mention it saves you a lot of money booking online? It's that easy. Grab Atlas VPN using the link in the description and secure your data today. What keeps them from going, well, we're worried about health. We're worried about public health. We're worried about protecting people. The primary symptom of the coronavirus is a fever, right? This develops before the cough and persists uh, throughout the course of the virus. It's your immune system fighting it off. Uh, we're going to send an order to every fitness tracker um, that can get something like pulse or heart rate. Uh, and we're going to start demanding access to this kind of activity. Um, and now we're going to go, well, these people have elevated pulses. Uh, and now, you know, five years later, the coronavirus is gone. This data is still available to them. They start looking for new things. They already know what you're looking at on the Internet, right? Uh, they already know uh, where your phone is moving. Now they know what your heart rate is, your pulses. What happens when they start to intermix these and apply artificial intelligence to it? And Harari asks, uh, if you have this bracelet that tracks your temperature and your pulse, uh, and they know you're watching a video, or uh, you're just watching a speech from a and they see you get angry, right? Uh, because emotions really are biological processes. These are our products that have um, measurable states associated with them by sensors. And they go, well, this person doesn't like what's being said. Uh, it's one thing if an advertiser does this, it's still chilling, it's still dangerous, or a bank does it, or it happens in a job interview. But what happens when you have built, over the course of a generation, the architecture we are moving closer and closer to that world every day that we let panic motivate our decisions uh, rather than rational reflection regarding inevitable consequences uh, about this narrowing of our rights. We're not being asked for security or privacy. Um, in a free and open society, the thing is we're supposed to say uh, we need both. Uh, and this is derived from the protection of rights. If we begin destroying rights, sacrificing rights in order to improve things, we're actually making things worse.
how do you know when a phone is actually off? How do you know when it's actually not spying on you? There are potential ways that you can hack a phone where it appears to be off, but it's not actually off. It's just pretending to be off, whereas in fact, it's still listening in and doing all this stuff. Your phone is sitting there doing nothing, you think, but it's constantly shouting and saying, I'm here. Who is closest to me? The phone has the screen off. You don't know what it's connected to. You don't know how frequently it's doing it. And you don't even know what's happening because you can't see it. The device is talking all of the time. The question we have to ask is who is it talking to? There is an industry that is built on keeping this invisible. They can see everything about you. They can see everything about what your device is doing and they can do whatever they want with your device. Wherever you go, your phone goes. It knows what you bought. It knows who you talk to. It knows what you're interested in. It's seen every photograph that you've had. The phone is really an extension of the self. It's a part of you. So my trust in technology is limited. You can't awaken someone who's pretending to be asleep. You got a smartphone, right? You, you might be listening to this. You, you got a phone somewhere in the room. The phone is turned off, or at least the screen is turned off. It's sitting there. And if somebody sends you a message, the screen blinks to life. How does that happen? How is it that if someone from any corner of the earth uh, dials a number, your phone rings and nobody else's rings? Every smartphone uh, is constantly connected to the nearest cellular tower. Every phone, even when the screen is off, you think it's doing nothing, you can't see it because radio frequency emissions are invisible, but it's constantly shouting and saying, I'm here. Who is closest to me? It's a cell phone tower. And every cell phone tower with its big ears uh, is listening and it compares notes with the other network towers and your smartphone compares notes with them to go, who do I hear the loudest? And who you hear the loudest is a proxy for closeness, distance. They go, whoever I hear more loudly than anybody else, that's close to me. So you're gonna be bound to this cell phone tower and that cell phone tower is gonna make a note, a permanent record saying, this phone handset with this phone number at this time was connected to me. And based on your phone handset and your phone number, uh, they can get your identity. But what this means is that whenever you're carrying a phone, whenever the phone is turned on, uh, there's a record of your presence at that place that is being made and created by companies. Now, these things are stored. Now, these things are saved. It doesn't matter whether you're doing anything wrong. It doesn't matter whether you're the most ordinary person uh, on earth, because that's how bulk collection, which is the government's euphemism for mass surveillance, works. They simply collect it all in advance in hopes that one day it will become useful. The thing with shutting your phone off that is a risk is how do you know your phone's actually turned off? When I was in Geneva, working for the CIA, we would all carry like drug dealer phones. The old smartphones, or sorry, old dumb phones, they're not smartphones. Uh, and the reason why was just because they had removable, the removable backs yeah. where you could take the battery out. And the, the one beautiful thing about technology is if there's no electricity in it, there's no battery connected to it, it's not sending anything because you have to get power from somewhere. You have to have power in order to do work. But now your phones are all sealed, right? You can't take the batteries out. So there are potential ways that you can hack a phone where it appears to be off, but it's not actually off. It's just pretending to be off. Whereas in fact, it's still listening in and doing all this stuff. I wrote a paper on this specific problem. How do you know when a phone is actually off? How do you know when it's actually not spying on you? With a brilliant, brilliant guy named Andrew Bunny Huang called the introspection engine. But for average people, right? This is academic. That's not your primary threat. Your primary threats are these bulk collection programs. Your primary threat is the fact that your phone is constantly squawking to these cell phone towers. It's doing all of these things because we leave our phones in a state that is constantly on. You're constantly connected. But the whole idea is we need to identify the problem. And the central problem with smartphone use today is you have no idea what the hell it's doing at any given time. Like the phone has the screen off. You don't know what it's connected to. You don't know how frequently it's doing it. And you don't even know what's happening because you can't see it, right? And this is the problem with the data collection you use today is there is an industry that is built on keeping this invisible. They can see everything about you. They can see everything about what your device is doing and they can do whatever they want with your device. I want you to think about the power of your phone. Think about all the different sensors that are on it. It has radios for cellular communication. It's got receivers for satellite communication, like GPS signals. Um, it knows the location where you are at any given time, even if you turn location services off, as long as you're connected to the phone network, and then seen every photograph that you've had. Uh, these are intensely private, intensely
intensely personal things. Um, and the thing is, our phones have become such a necessary part of our lives uh, for, for everyone, not just communications. You want to get a job, you want to communicate with your family. Um, again, you want to make a purchase. People increasingly use their phones to do that. So the phone is really an extension of the self. It's a part of you. And now there are private companies that have no business besides creating ways to hack into these phones. And then they sell these hacking methods to governments around the world, including some very bad uh, governments that we would agree with having these capabilities. What about enabling your microphone camera? If you can do it, they can do it. Uh, it is trivial uh, to remotely turn on your microphone or to, to activate your camera so long as you have systems level access. If you had hacked someone's device remotely, anything they can do, you can do. The screen may be off as it's sitting on your desk, uh, but the device is talking all of the time. The question we have to ask is who is it talking to? Even if your phone is not hacked, right now, you look at it, it's just sitting there on the charger. Uh, it is talking tens or hundreds or thousands of times a minute to any number of different companies uh, who have apps installed on your phone. Uh, it looks like it's off, it looks like it's just sitting there, but it is constantly chattering. And unfortunately, like pollution, uh, we have not created the tools that are necessary for ordinary people to be able to see this activity. And it is the invisibility of it that makes it so popular and common uh, and attractive for these companies. Because if you do not realize they're collecting this data from you, this very private and personal data, um, there's no way you're going to object to it. Once your phone is hacked, what is in their hands is not simply your device, it is your future. But we see how these same technologies are being applied to create what they call the social credit system. If any of your activities online, if your purchases, if your associations, if your friends are in any way different from what the government or the powers that be of the moment uh, would like them to be, uh, you're no longer able to purchase train tickets. You're no longer able to board an airplane. You may not be able to get a passport. You may not be eligible for a job. You might not be able to work for the government. Uh, all of these things are increasingly being created and programmed and decided by algorithms. And those algorithms are fueled by precisely the innocent data that our devices are creating all of the time, constantly, invisibly, quietly, right now. Our devices are casting all of these records uh, that we do not see being created, that in aggregate seem very innocent. You were at Starbucks at this time. Uh, you went to the hospital afterwards. You spent a long time at the hospital. After you left the hospital, you made a phone call. You made a phone call to your mother. You talked to her until the middle of the night. The hospital was an oncology clinic. Um, even if you can't see the content of these communications, the activity records, what the government calls metadata, which they argue they do not need a warrant to collect, um, tells the whole story. And these activity records are being created and shared and collected and intercepted constantly by companies and governments. Uh, and ultimately it means uh, as they sell these, as they trade these, as they make their businesses on the backs of these records, what they are selling uh, is not information. What they are selling is us. They're selling our future. They're selling our past. They are selling our history, our identity, and ultimately, they are stealing our power.
task. What changed with technology is that surveillance could now become indiscriminate. It could become a uh, dragnet. It could become bulk collection. Uh, the government did it. They used classification. Um, companies did it. Uh, they intentionally didn't talk about it. They denied uh, these things were going. They, they said, uh, you agreed to this. You clicked a button that said, I agree, because you were trying to open an account so you could talk to your friends. You were trying to get driving directions. You were trying to get an email account. You weren't trying to agree to some 600 page legal form uh, that even if you read, you wouldn't understand. And it doesn't matter even if you did understand because one of the very first paragraphs in it said, this agreement can be changed at any time unilaterally without your consent by the company. And so long as they do that, companies are gonna be extraordinarily powerful.